Ralph Nader really needs no introduction, but that's my job to give an introduction. Um, he, through his work with Public Citizen and other organizations and interest groups, as well as his, his presidential campaign, he's been one of our most active citizens, challenging government and corporate abuse and urging all of us to participate in political action. Um, his books include The 17 Solutions, The 17 Traditions, and Unsafe at Any Speed about the American automobile industry. With unrelenting persistence, humor, and wit, he continues to call our presidents to accountability even as they are ignoring the critical issues of our time. And this current collection, Return to Sender, Unanswered Letters to the President, 2001 to 2015, is um, is his writing over the last several years. So thank you all for following his blogs, his email, um, his posts in the Huffington Post. And um, without further ado, I give you Ralph Nader. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Andrew. Uh, can you all hear me in the back? Okay, thank you for being here. Um, I think one way to support uh, independent bookstores, by the way, is for all of us, uh, whenever we want to go to a book signing, to pledge that we'll bring someone half our age there. <laughs> uh, one of the things they don't teach us in elementary school and high school is how easy it is uh, to turn the country around on major issues assuming that it represents majority opinion. And even though we can quote uh, Abraham Lincoln, who said, with public sentiment, you can achieve anything, and without it, you can't achieve much of anything at all, uh, we still convey to young people uh, that it's really impossible. You know, you can't fight City Hall, and you can't take on Exxon Mobil. And then it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, and they internalize their own powerlessness. Uh, so. I have written a lot of these books, 17 Solutions. Most of them are majoritarian supported. Most of them are completely ignored by presidential candidates and candidates for Congress. It's quite interesting disconnect that uh, most of these issues are off the table. They're not even discussed. And of course, if you don't discuss it, <laughs> it, it doesn't go no anywhere. It, you can't mobilize the, dy the dynamics. And then uh, there's a a long strategy uh, for 2,000 years or so of divide and rule by power structures. Uh, so here we are told we're polarized, we're, uh, we're liberal, conservative, blue state, red state, you know, they have all these names, and we're gridlocked, and we're, we're par paralyzed. Uh, and if you say, well, where are we uh, uh, divided? And they, you know, they put the list out, reproductive rights and school prayer and deregulation, things like that. And then you say, well, where are we uh, on the same page between left, right, and silence? You see, so I did this book, 24 major areas, you name it, uh, where you get a majority because of left, right support. And it's not just civil liberties and the Patriot Act, it's the military budget, it's uh, juvenile justice and prison reform, now the death penalty, Adopt, uh, abolished in Nebraska with left-right legislators making their own arguments. Some of them are the same, some of them are different. Uh, we see a huge left-right uh, convergence against crony capitalism, or what we call corporate welfare, bailout of Wall Street, for example, the, the Main Street versus Wall Street, uh, on and on. And, uh, but it's not, it's off the table. You know, it's not, there's no nonprofit citizen advocacy groups just focusing on left-right uh, convergence. So you see, you get a lot of demoralization around the country. People get discouraged, and they can do one of two things. They can get upset and roar back, or the majority uh, get cynical, uh, think they're intellectually smart by being cynical. You know, pox on all their houses, they're all crooks, you know. Two easy ways to go through life. One is to believe everything, and one is to believe nothing, right? So you don't have to think either way. And then they withdraw. And the withdrawal is more than just half the electorate and doesn't vote, or more than half in primaries and congressional uh, midterms. Uh, but it's a total withdrawal where people don't even show up. And you know this. 
Uh, when you show up, so you know exactly what I'm talking about. How many times you're on the phone begging people to come to neighborhood meetings, town meetings, to vote, and you're not trying to persuade them on the issue. They agree with you. I mean, you're calling your list. And just to get them to break their routine uh, and stop making excuses for themselves that they don't have time for a democratic society and all that it brings us, uh, or they're watching the screens. And now they don't just have to watch the TV screens. In, in my frustration, I believe in frustration, by the way, because it's, uh, it stimulates creativity. We, uh, we have a way of trying to bring people out. We give them $2 bills. Uh, the $2 bill has Jefferson. Can you imagine relegating Jefferson to a $2 bill? And, and Jackson is, you know. Uh, um, and on the other side uh, is, a, is a gathering of the white males who came together on July 4th, 1776 to sign the Declaration of Independence. And, you know, you can say all about it. Some of them were slave owners and so on. But they thought they were signing their death warrant because they were challenging the most powerful uh, military in the world, King George and his redcoats. And so you, you show it to people today, young people, you say, you like this? Yeah, yeah, that's cool. He says, it's cool. Uh, aren't you glad they showed up? Yeah, I, I guess so. Uh, don't, don't you think you should show up? You know, they're not around anymore, you know. You got to show up. You try everything. We plaster these on windshield, on wind, windows, you know, big blown up $2 bills. By the way, the nice thing about it is because nobody uses it, it's brand new when you ask the bank for a packet. So it's like it's just printed. All right, so why, why would I want to deflate my ego and put out a book entitled Unanswered Letters to the President, <laughs> 2001 to 2015? Uh, 103 letters unanswered. Someone said, why didn't you stop at four? <laughs> uh, because there's a larger issue here. And the most democratic media is when you write a letter to an elected official because it can't be censored and it can't be distorted. It's you to your delegatee. You know, to you. It's you to the senators and representative president you invested huge power and uh, it's being disrespected we're at a low point uh, at getting uh, politicians uh, at all levels even to acknowledge uh, that you wrote them a letter just the courtesy of saying thank you we received the letter taking into consideration what you wrote and so after a while um, the few people who do write letters don't bother uh, let's take let's take a little poll here. How many of you? This is not a typical audience. <laughs> How many of you have ever written a letter to the president? Uh, can it, can you see see even here? It's it's a pretty small percentage. To be generous is probably twenty percent. Um, and uh, how many of you keep writing letters to presidents? <laughs> okay. Um, now. The problem is it's a little more complex than it was years ago because of email. I understand the White House has like a, a limit on email. You can't go on and on. It's like 2,400 characters, um, which I don't know. Th these were all sent uh, by postal and by email and by uh, fax. And then they, they, uh, last year they stopped the fax machine to the White House. <laughs> You can't uh, fax it. Uh, I did get, to be fair, I did get one letter from President Obama and one letter from uh, President Bush. And they both asked, asked me for money. <laughs> so I took an opportunity to respond. And, uh, and, uh, Mr. Bush asked me to contribute to his library, his presidential library. And he made flamboyant representations about what the library was going to do for America. And so I wrote him a, a letter reminding him of some of the things he did as president. But I said, I do want to make a contribution. So I sent him a copy, hardback, of Clyde Preskowitz's book, Rogue Nation. <laughs> Thought it would be a good, good contribution to the library. Uh, so the, uh, <laughs> the, the idea here is... 
One, the letters are very substantive, and they're on almost everything you could be concerned about, probably. Uh, domestic, international. And th they were designed to do one of four things. To tell the president what I thought he should do, to tell the president what I thought he shouldn't do or continue doing, to tell the president something going on in his government that he might not know about, and to tell the president what people are doing around the country that he might not know about. And that's, I think, our responsibility uh, to do that. Now, when President Obama was president-elect, he talked about a bubble in the White House, and he was going to break the bubble. And he did not want to have a bubble in the White House. So he announced that he was going to be given 10 letters to read at night, and just before he goes to bed be selected by his uh, correspondence chief. So I got a hold of the correspondence chief, trying to elbow him in here. <laughs> and and uh, uh, this was three months into his administration. And I said, uh, uh, what is your policy on correspondence? I mean, you, all kinds of different letters. You know, there are the vituperative six six word letter. Uh, there's the thoughtful letter. There's a letter from a contributor. There's a letter from the 11 year old that might be used as a political prop by a president. And then there are the high profile issues that people write a lot of letters on. So like a GM bailout during that period where they have form letters. And, and, and then there's a letter inviting the president to attend your daughter's high school graduation. And they, they, that's the one category they always reply to. You know, they give their regrets and they wish uh, well. Now, there are large numbers of volunteers who go to the White House every day. They're cleared, and they separate the letters into these categories. Apparently, they get about a half a million letters uh, a, uh, a week. And uh, in Canada, you can write to your member of parliament free. You don't need a stamp. So there's a... Uh, a, a two-way franking privilege, but but not here. But so that's a lot of letters. But you know, it's, it, people who get a lot of letters know that the, a lot of letters are. Some of them are just burps, burps of rage or in, incomprehensible uh, uh, sequences, and so they don't spend much time on those. But they do categorize them, so you get some sense that they're they're receiving them. Uh, but you never know if you don't fall in the category of the high school graduation or a high profile issue. For example, I wrote a substantive letter on the GM bailout and I got a form letter that had the, f uh, it was like this, you know. It, it, didn't, it didn't reply to my letter, it was just a form letter. It was funny the way it uh, assumed that I had said something which I, I didn't say uh, in the letter. Uh, so as these uh, developed, I began to see other values to letters because if you write a letter, let's say you're concerned about a public issue, okay? Um, but if you write a letter on it, it commits you more. It, it commits you more. I mean, you go to the next step, which is good. So you push yourself to the next step. If you've got a civic sensitivity and you get ignored, it makes you angry, which is good. It's good you know, you become morally indignant or whatever, which is a, a motivation. Uh, and if you do that with children at a young age, for, for example, there's a flurry of letters from 10-year-olds to President Bush, uh, and the letters basically said, we, we want to ask you just one question. Uh, the Iraq and Afghan wars are costing 100 billion or whatever uh, so many months. And uh, our question is simple, simply, why don't you pay for it? Why are you making us pay for it in the next generation? Because there is no taxation for the wars, uh, these wars. They were put on a credit card. You know, I think that might have made an impact if they were each released to the press, even if it's just one. Sometimes it flares and press grabs it. Now, the press has some responsibility here because years ago, we would write letters to Senator Magnuson uh, asking him for a hearing on some consumer environmental worker issue, or uh, and uh, the Post would pick it up, or the Times would pick it up. I remember once I, I wrote a letter on uh, 
what, what I called white lung, white lung disease, which is uh, the analog to coal miners' black lung disease by textile workers. They would breathe in the tiny fibers uh, from the dust, the cotton dust, in the carding rooms, North Carolina, South Carolina. And the Post wrote it like it was a major piece because it had new material in it. And uh, th that doesn't happen anymore. Some of us remember that scientists at MIT and Harvard would collectively write a president urging uh, a faster movement toward nuclear arms control. And that would be uh, considered news. Uh, the press now, is, and the White House press, they just have no interest whatsoever uh, in uh, uh, diversifying their boredom uh, as they go up to the White House uh, every, every day. So that's another blockage. So I, I decided I needed some comparative information. So I, I wrote, I wanted to do this anyway, but it had an ancillary effect. I wrote two critical letters to Prime Minister Harper of Canada. They were really critical. And um, I got back a nice uh, recognition of the letter. They acknowledged receipt by the chief of correspondence. Um, and uh, they said, uh, we've absorbed your message, and we're referring it to the respective ministry. Now, you know, who knows what, uh, how much they absorbed or wanted to absorb, but at least you know it got there. And you, you know somebody read it, even if they may not have liked to read it. The second time I did this, I released it to the media, and it made CBC News, as well as a major radio program in Toronto. So... Well, Canada is, is unfortunately being dragged down by its mimicking of the U.S. under conservative uh, governments. There is still uh, lessons to be learned from Canada as well as, as, as other countries where you don't get any, even an acknowledgement anymore, uh, which raises the question of courtesy. I, I'm trying to get Judith Martin, who's Miss Manners, uh, to do a, an article on this. You might want to email her and ask her. It's a bit of a stretch conceptually from some of the things she's written because it isn't that a personal affront, you know, at uh, some restaurant with bees flying around or something. So uh, now the other thing that was quite uh, serious is on the eve of the Iraq war, um, we totaled up about 300 retired generals, admirals, colonels, uh, diplomats, uh, national security people, people like uh, uh, four-star general, head of the NSA, formerly head of the NSA, Howard Odom, General Anthony Zinni, uh, Marine general retired, Admiral Shanahan, head of the Pacific Fleet, retired, the two major security advisors to George Herbert Walker Buff, Bush, John, uh, Jim Baker, and Brent Scrowcroft, they all did what almost has never been done as uh, the U.S. beats the drums to its wars. Uh, they, they spoke against it. Uh, they wrote op-eds. Some of you may remember they, uh, they really uh, stood tall. And then, you know, nothing happened uh, because they didn't have an infrastructure, they didn't have a secretariat, uh, and they went back home. Uh, and they couldn't multiply their numbers. And you remember at that time, the media was really a patsy on this. And, you, you know, you had poor Ted Koppel. You put the helmet on and went in with the tanks. I mean, when, when you look back on it, they've got to be embarrassed, including the New York Times and what they did, the phony articles on weapons of mass destru destruction. And so we, we tried one last move with a letter. We sent a letter. Uh, to George uh, W. Bush's mother and his father and his wife. And Bakesy said, you got to control this boy. <laughs> you know? And, uh, and that's in here. And, and one of the things that prompted us to do this was that in the prior three months, four months maybe, about a dozen groups with millions of members uh, begged to see Bush in the White House because some of them had been to Iraq. They didn't agree with the scenario that was coming out of the White House. And it was uh, an amazing situation where they, they, these were veteran, a veteran group, a business group, a retired intelligence officials group, the National Council of Churches, a women's peace group, a student group, even a labor group. 
and they never even got acknowledged. These, these people had millions of members out there, never got acknowledged, never mind, uh, come on in, let's hear your point of view. So this is a very serious syndrome, is it not, in terms of uh, the deterioration of our, uh, of our political system. And what are we doing about it? Uh, and uh, why don't we ask ourselves, what, what can we do up to a point where nobody can stop us? What is it that we can do that nobody can stop us from doing? And to take a baseball analogy, no one can really stop us from getting at least to second base. No one's going to stop us mobilizing ourselves and marching and uh, starting groups. You have someone like George Soros, who is dead set against the Iraq War. You know, he's very rich now. He's maybe $30 billion if he keeps up counting. <laughs> he's made about $2, 3000000000 billion in each year in the last few years. And he probably didn't think of it, but I, I couldn't get my... A message returned from him, but if he set up a, a secretariat for these 300 retired uh, military, diplomatic, and national security, uh, he staffed them, in other words, and he mediated, he provided, gave him media, and uh, put the heat on Capitol Hill for hearings to expose the, the lies and the deceptions uh, for a few tens of millions of dollars, it would have turned the tide. Because, first of all, they would have tripled their number almost immediately, from 300 to 1,000. And who's going to be able to stand up against these people? Are they going to question their patriotism? Are they going to question their experience? Are they going to question their bona fides? These retired former uh, high officials of Republican, Democrat. Uh, it was just a, And then the next year, he spent millions of dollars trying to uh, help uh, marches and rallies and so on. But it, w it was too late. Uh, so th th always ask ourselves, are we making excuses for ourselves? Why don't we talk to our friends and neighbors, serious talk in the middle of all the small talk? Um, you know, how many times people come up to you and say, uh, how are you? And, and, you know, no matter how you are, you say, okay, I'm feeling okay. How are you? Okay. What a waste of salutations. <laughs> I mean, just think what you can say. You can say, uh, uh, or you, someone comes up and says, uh, how's business? Or uh, how's your love life? Or uh, how's the family? And you come up and say instead, how's your civic life? You know, how's my civic life? You know, well, it starts a conversation, doesn't it? Right? But we're inhibited. We are enormously restrained from the kind of dialogue that our forebears had during the committees on correspondence, the farmers in, in Massachusetts in 1774, shame us. There's a book written on this called the, Fir the First American Revolution. And it wasn't Lexington and Concord in Boston. They got all the credit. Uh, it was 1774 when King George ordered the replacement of their court officials, their sheriffs, and their town officials with Tories. And the farmers uh, organized at levels and self-restraint. They didn't use violence. Uh, that is a, a great lesson today. Uh, for example, in towns like Worcester and uh, Springfield, uh, one thing they did when they, the, their court officials were replaced in the sheriff is they stopped using the courts. They boycotted the courts. And they would surround, with 500 to 1,000 farmers, they would surround the house of the Tory, and they would say, we want you to recant. And they would just stand there, silently. And this Tory's looking out to see a farmers, you know, and they're not going away. And, uh, and uh, when they did recant, they made them repeat like five times. Come out, they'd have a path, and they would recant. Or if they didn't recant, They'd flee to Boston, where there was a red coat garrison. The, di the discipline and how they decided on a rotating spokespeople uh, basis and so on, at one point they had 5,000 people show up. This is, you know, when Massachusetts was small population. Uh, and so I, I think we, uh, we've got to stop making excuses for ourselves. And we've got to join the existing groups we believe in who want more su supporters, want people more engaged, more advocates, or start our own groups. Uh, 
There's a little book that came out in 1941 by the former head of the Tennessee Valley Authority. And when he retired, he's trying to figure out how do, how do things change for the better? What's the ignition? Uh, what, what, what works? So he goes all over the world trying to learn. He goes to India. He goes to uh, Europe and, and South America. And he comes back and he writes a book called The Small Community. And his conclusion was everything big starts with very small civic energies. And now we know that, but he wrote a very nice book elaborating that, uh, which should be reissued. Last point I'd like to make for a discussion is uh, uh, there were times when the frustration with our perverse priorities really got to me. Uh, the war on terror. So the war on terror has now cost us trillions of dollars, thousands of lives here, millions of casualties over there, the socio side of these c countries, and has resulted in a, a more monetized political system than can be imagined. It's enormously strengthened giant corporations, and it's chilled dissent, which is the mother of assent, right? I mean, when you chill dissent, it's not just a mere inconvenience. Uh, even chilling the dissent of the opposing party. And so I... Uh, I've been involved a lot in uh, non-anthropomorphic preventable violence, otherwise known as viruses, bacteria, uh, silent violence of corporate crime, pollution, toxics, defective products. You know, they don't come with an anthropomorphic image. And we're very susceptible to focusing on anthropomorphic crime. Uh, for example, we'll spend infinitely more time on massively fewer casualties from street crime than we will from crime in the suites, even though far more people die, far more people lose their savings, far more people are injured and made sick by corporate crime. Russell Mokhyper, who's the editor of the Corporate Crime Reporter, uh, put this in a book called Corporate Crime and Violence. And the, the key thing is preventability. Uh, there, there are varieties of intent, monetary intent, vicious criminal intent, negligence, but the key thing to make you give it a priority is how preventable. And when the Centers for Disease Control says that 200 to 250 Americans die every day from hospital-induced infections, how many people don't know people who didn't get an infection? Um, that's serious violence. And now the hospitals are starting to require uh, doctors and nurses to wash their hands more frequently, and it, it, it's working. Uh, but just think of that, 200, 250. And when you have uh, 60,000 people dying from workplace-related diseases, mostly silent violence, mostly toxics, and dust levels, and so on, um, and OSHA gets a budget less than the budget to guard the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad and its personnel. Imagine that. Uh, 550 million is OSHA's budget, 650 million are the contractor's budget to guard the giant embassy in Baghdad and its personnel. You start looking for more than just the phrase perverse priorities. Uh, and again and again, you see very little money, very little law enforcement is applied to corporate sourced violence, whether it's occupational disease, whether it's product defects, whether it's medical malpractice, hospital infections, uh, whether it's denial of health insurance and people die when they can't get health insurance to diagnose, get money to have doctors to diagnose their treatment and, and treat it. Uh, by the way, before Obamacare, it's down a little now, 45,000 Americans die every year because they can't afford health insurance to get diagnosed and treated in time. That's a peer-reviewed Harvard Medical School study that appeared in the Journal of Public Health, 2009, December, if you're interested. Just imagine, compare that with 9-11, just in terms of casualty levels. And that's just one sector. So what, I, what did I do is I wrote President Obama a letter from a particularly virulent E. coli that was in a Petri dish in Austria. So E. coli, in effect, writes President Obama and says that uh, 
I am about to expire. I know I lived a despicable life in the minds of human beings. There were casualties from this this, uh, E. coli. But I do want to redeem myself. And then E. coli lectures President Obama about who the real terrorists are in terms of global epidemics and so on and the need to do something about it. Um, No answer from the White House. I sent it, and this is the power of, this is the uses of letters. You send these letters around. You don't just send it to the elected official. You send the letters around. So I sent it to the Centers for Disease Control, and the feedback was that they really got a kick out of it. I mean, they sent it around, and, uh, uh, and so when you do write letters to elected officials, it's always good to put CC interested parties so they don't know necessarily who it's going to, but it's going to people. <laughs> right? Or if you want to summon them for a town meeting back home, which people should do, citizen summons, uh, you basically say, well, only 10 people signed this letter. Uh, Senator, you may not think this is enough. You want another 100? Just call me. We'll get it to you in a week. And this person's a real networker. So there is, there is ways to write letters in, in more uh, effective manner. Uh, but I did write both Uh, Bush and Obama asking him what their policy, after a number of unanswered letters, what their policy was on answering letters. And I got no answer. (laughs) So I did want to give them one last opportunity. Uh, The letters, uh, they don't take that long to write when you're working in an area. And uh, because you think about them ahead of time. Uh, and and the, the important thing, I hope, in this book, uh, you know, it was mentioned in the New York Times recently, but in this book that, that people will say, uh, I'm going to do the same thing, and uh, I'm going to send this letter around. So if they don't acknowledge it, there are a lot of people who are going to learn about it, and, and uh, maybe I'll turn it into a letter to the editor uh, or, or what have you. I, I read the letter, Harvey, your letter, uh, in the post you know, that you wrote. Yeah, so, uh, all right, so that's, you know, basically, I'm not going to bore you by reading a letter or two, but uh, if you can, um, if you can um, leave, leave this gathering uh, with a greater resolve to put your, uh, put your thoughts on paper, uh, the book would have been, uh, would have been a success. Thank you very much. So we have we have two microphones. Uh, the gentleman in the purple shirt over here, he can start. But if the people want to line up here with questions, then um, everybody in the audience can hear you. It'll be recorded for our um, our audio recording, which we can make available to you. And um, please feel free to engage in the civic discourse. Thank you. Uh, thank you for coming tonight. Uh, I uh, just had a question. I grew up in Florida. Uh, I was I was a teenager in 2000 during the 2000 election. Uh, of course, we all know Bush uh, became president by 537 votes. Uh, you received 97,000 votes in the 2000 election. Uh, I feel confident in saying most of them probably came at the uh, Al Gore's. Uh, Al Gore would have gotten most of those votes. Uh, do you have any regrets 15 years out? Uh, for, uh, in effect, putting uh, George W. Bush in the White House. See, see, this is this is what destroys liberal politics in America. First of all, he's factually wrong, and uh, if you ever took a statistics course, you would flunk it, because you want me to give you ten sine qua nons, any one of which would have put Gore in the White House. Let's start with winning the popular vote. Have you spoken out against the Electoral College lately, where you can come in second? And win the presidency. Okay. Now let's start with uh, let's start with 250,000 Democrats who voted for Bush in Florida. Let's start with Kathleen Harris, Jeb Bush, who stole the election in so many ways. Let's start with the 5-4 decision uh, by the Supreme Court blocking the Florida Supreme Court uh, decision to have a full recount, which would have turned differently. Let's start with. Gore losing his home state of Tennessee alone (laughs) would have put him in the White House. Losing Arkansas with Clinton alone would have put him in the White House. 
Uh, let's start with these. Why do you pick on the Green Party and my campaign? Because the Democrats, first of all, they don't understand the dynamics of campaign. Whenever there's a third party challenger, assuming it isn't as big as Perot, you know, 19 million votes, we were chicken feed in, in terms of responding to it. The Democrats did a lot of things they wouldn't have done to get more votes for two reasons. One is Buchanan was on the other side, you know, in Florida. He got a lot of votes. You, did you like Buchanan running? It's okay for him to run, right? Okay, because he took it from Bush, right? Uh, and the other thing is that, and this is the most fundamental thing, if you agree that we all have an equal right to run for public office, then we're all spoilers of one another, or none of us are spoilers. Because what you're telling me is I should have aborted my First Amendment rights to speak, petition, and assemble, and you're telling me I should have kept my mouth shut, and you're telling me that I should not have been concerned about all these other people who are dying and getting killed and injured that the Democrats and Republicans are ignoring, of a few of which I alluded to. That's what you're telling me. You know, I would never tell you not to speak, not to petition, not to assemble, even if I despised what you said. The other point is, aren't you glad that the people in 1840, a few thousand of them voted for the Liberty Party, the first party to come out against uh, slavery? Aren't you glad that there were some women's suffrage parties? Wouldn't you, would you say they shouldn't have voted? They shouldn't have taken votes away from the Republicans and the Democrats or the Whigs? You see, you have to do your homework. The fundamental s mistake you made is basically to say that even though the Democrats aren't all that great, the Republicans are worse, Therefore, we should let them both become worse every four years under the pull of the corporations and shut up. But you see, what you don't understand is that my, my motivation comes from those people out there that both parties are ignoring and they're being disrespected and, and unemployed and un, uninsured and harmed and not protected from avoidable violence. Now, I don't think I'll ever convince you, but uh, I, I'm glad you, you stood there and listened to it. Okay. Yeah, yes, go ahead. What would it take for you to become president of the United States? <laughs> what would it take? <laughs> it would take enough people, whether it's me or some other progressive, it would take enough people to take control of a major party at the precinct level back home the way the Tea Party has influenced the Republican Party. So you start where you, they can't really stop you. They can stop you at, at more advanced levels if you intersect at that level, like ballot access obstacles. But every, the two major parties have these little town committees, you see. And that's where you should start. And, and, and the right wing understands that far better than liberals. On the left. Okay. <clears throat> Ralphie, I would like you to come to bat for just about um, every kind of issue except, say, uh, Bryce Harper coming to bat for the uh, Washington Nationals. Lately. Yeah, lately. <laughs> but. My question to you has to do with Hillary Clinton running for president. She doesn't seem to have much competition from any other women, and I don't like the idea of having to vote for her because she's the only woman running. It's like endorsing a dictator. You know, the dictator is the only person that's going to get voted for. So if the dictator gets a lot of votes, so what? Uh, where is the competition? Are there are some other women that, uh, to me, would be more attractive? Well, I mean, we shouldn't think that way anymore. You know, the, uh, the, the coronation syndrome, or the dynasty of Bush and Clinton, Clinton and Bush, uh, demeans the talent pool in this country. I mean, imagine we're over 300 million people. 
with all kinds of capable people whose names we don't know because we're a celebrity culture, and we're down to a handful. Uh, so I, I would go beyond just the business of being a woman, uh, being the first president. Uh, f far more important is to get the right president, and, and uh, uh, that's that's what's really at stake. I mean, I think Hillary is not the Hillary of when she was 30 years old. She made peace with the power structure, and she is a um, a deep corporatist and a deep militarist. I mean, uh, one can almost forgive the corporatism. She moved to New York with Bill to, because that's where the power is in Wall Street. But his, her militarism is absolutely shocking. And, I mean, she almost single-handedly um, uh, did the Libyan war. I mean, the Defense Department uh, was against it, Gates, and she persuaded the White House. Uh, that it was an easy topple uh, without knowing that in a tribal society with nothing uh, uh, to replace it. You would have civil war, sectarian killings, spilling into Africa, weapons everywhere, Mali, Central Africa. Uh, and she's, be being, uh, she's being accused of Benghazi, you know, the, the, that. The big thing is the huge amount of geography now has been destabilized and because of the Libyan overthrow. Uh, so she's and when she was on the Senate Armed Services Committee, she never met a weapon system she didn't like. She's, you see, this is the problem of women trying to overcompensate right. and becoming more aggressive and macho, so they're not accused of being soft on the need to kill war, right? Instead of taking the tradition of women of peace and b turning it into a muscular waging of peace and conflict prevention. Uh, she did dissent, the reverse, and Albright did the reverse, and Anne Marie Slaughter did the reverse, and uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, and, and some of Obama's advisors did the worst. We have to be transcendent on this. We have to really go right to the core of what people are f standing for, fighting for, and fighting against. Now, O'Malley's going to announce in four or five days. Uh, you'll have Chafee, former governor of I uh, Rhode Island, he'll go in. Uh, probably former Senator Jim Webb. But unlike the Republican counterparts, they don't have billionaire patrons. Like 12 Republicans have, you know, literally, uh, they all have their patron now. And uh, so I don't know how long they're going to last. And of course, there's Bernie Sanders, who uh, made a good speech, I hear, uh, just now in, in Vermont. Uh, so we'll see. A lot of it is the <coughs> absurdity of shaping the candidacies uh, through Iowa and New Hampshire. I mean, you start with the conservative states. I mean, what if they started with Massachusetts and California, for example? Yeah. It would be different. Uh, and Iowa is just a caucus. It's how many buses you can you know, bring in and how good the food is. You know, uh, the, the whole thing is, uh, you know, I had a, a publisher, a publisher of Unsafe and Easy Speed, uh, Richard Grossman, who's a great man. And uh, he, he once developed this phrase, you know, I, I said, you know, satire is what we need in this country, right? He said, how, he says, no, he says, the, the big problem is how do you satire satire? That's, so we really got to get very serious and it's like the country's being twirled around in a tiny pivot by a few self-selected politicians who make their peace with the, with the power structure, the 1%. Yes. On the right. Yeah. Um, two questions. Uh, the first question uh, pertaining to your book. Um, um, I do not know if you know anything about. Um, obviously, people have been sending uh, letters to the president for, from the very beginning. Okay. What you are confronting here is a non-response. <laughs> Uh, has this non-response developed during a certain amount of, during, the, during the last 30 years? I mean, does it, uh, you know, does it uh, come together with uh, neoliberalism? Or was this a development that was taking place for a long time and now it's basically, you know, plateaued? Well, the non-acknowledgement is relatively recent. This, this acknowledging the letter. So that you get the feeling that at least it reached right. there. So. And in terms of responding, yeah, I, my, my experience is it's getting worse. I mean, uh, I, I used to get responses from Joe Califano, sometimes from Jimmy Carter. 
Uh, nobody expects them all to respond, but they have a lot of staff and departments and agencies that they can refer uh, to for a substantive response. So I think it is getting worse. Uh, the second question. Um, you know, I'm always, uh, when I'm an audience, a I must be honest with you about this, a little bit irritated when uh, a speaker says, you know, uh, you know, after they give the presentation, tell the people like, well, just get together and revolt, right? And you are obviously uh, too complex for that and too sophisticated for that because you, you point out some facts, factors, right? Education, propaganda, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm, I'm sure you have thought, right? <laughs> I'm fundamentally sure about that. That, But why? I mean, the people are not stupid. The people are no, no in, America, in the United States. I'm not from the United States of America. I'm from the Caribbean. But people know here. This, uh, the same thing's going on in Europe where I grew up. People know they are being bullshitted at this point in time. Excuse me for the word. They, they know they are being taken advantage of. The issue is why not revolting? Why not rising up? Why not saying, you know, enough is enough? You know, in Spain, the whole notion was, uh, you know, the, the, the protest, the system is the problem, right? And that's what it is. The system is the problem at this point in time. Why aren't people revolting? Is it a fear that if they really would revolt an American in a massive way, they would be facing massive, massive and, and, and genocidal violence from the, from the political class? I mean, you know, see what was going on in the 1960s. I believe the killing of Martin Luther King, all of these other guys must have had some type of freezing uh, you know people have a sense like well maybe you know maybe you know as if i'm not drowning completely uh, you know i'll keep my head down and just going so <coughs> what do you believe is stopping people i mean beyond the competition beyond the overworking beyond you know no time etc cetera, etc cetera, the fracturing of community what is stopping people from uh, the lack of uh, any type of ideological real alternative put forward to the people right although there are alternatives mm. put forward but not a broad alternative in the media what 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 do you believe mm. is is stopping people from well, revolting <clears throat> after world war ii with europe western europe destitute uh, they worked through unions, they worked through multi-party systems, they worked through co-ops, and they developed a social democratic state of full health insurance and, and uh, public transit and uh, free university tuition and four weeks paid vacation and better pensions and better public transit, better labor laws. In this country, we couldn't do it. We didn't have a multi-party system. We have a winner-take-all uh, we don't have proportional representation. Uh, we have weak labor unions, even weaker now, and our co-ops are, are almost invisible. So the difference is that when people think they can get a toehold, they will go for a toehold. If they don't think they can get a toehold, they'll say, why should we beat our head against the wall and uh, be ostracized and uh, it's not worth our uh, risk. So in, in Germany, um, if you get over 5% of the vote, you get over 5% of the parliament. In the U.S., you can get 49% of the vote. If someone gets 51, you get nothing. So that's why the Green Party is influential in, New Jer in, in Germany. And here, it cannot get a toehold because of the winner-take-all, not to mention the Electoral College, huge ballot access laws. <clears throat> it takes more effort to get on North Carolina than it does to get on seven European countries' ballots. So you see, it's, it's the genius of the, of the plutocracy, oligarchy here, is you keep the people from being able to get a toehold so they can build on it. And so that takes care of the political system. Economically, you have a situation of globalization now that's stripping uh, people of what remains of their bargaining power, not just union bargaining power. They're waking up and whole industries are being... Uh, uh, exported abroad uh, and their communities are being hollowed out, that in implodes their attention survival. They don't have time for, for resistance. It's just survival. Uh, in Spain and, and Greece, things have got so bad that people lost a lot of what they had. Uh, they had their oligarchies and so on, that they reached a breaking point of resistance. I mean, that could happen here. Uh, you can see uh, certain things bubbling up around the country. The minimum wage thing was pulled off by fewer people than live in Waterbury, Connecticut. I mean, just, you know, people who picketed a few hours in front of McDonald's, Burger King, SEIU's involvement, a few think tanks, our efforts, uh, people writing letters to the editor, and they take an issue like this where 30 million people are making less today than 1968, 
inflation adjusted, and they, they're making it a front burner issue. Now, instead of saying, holy smokes, less than 100,000 people pulled this off part time, you know, a few hours here and there, what else can we do? That lesson is not driven home. So when you say people are not stupid, it's, there's something worse than being stupid, and that is being powerless, feeling they're powerless. Feeling that they are powerless is worse than being stupid because that internalizes debility. Where being stupid, you can go to a meeting, you can connect with the Internet, you can inform yourself about what's going on. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I was a volunteer reader uh, of mail in the White House mm. uh, during um, Clinton's terms, and there's a woman here who was a reader in Obama's administration too. So what you say was true, and it was a lot of fun, and you can anybody can volunteer. Um, my question was: um, many of the community active s activism starts at the local level, like you said. Can you give us some examples? at the state and county level where letters have been pivotal or started uh, some social change? Yeah, well, for example, on pay, pay raises by state legislatures, <laughs> you get a flurry of letters, talk show hosts, that's an easy one uh, because it's very personal and, and uh, the politicians don't like to be nailed on <laughs> voting to increase uh, uh, their pay. but. Yeah, I mean, like Lois Gibbs, uh, who came out of uh, Love Canal and uh, never did anything civic. And her kids were getting sick up in Niagara Falls and came to Washington and started uh, a network of small groups who uh, were fighting toxic contamination. I mean, they're sellers in their streets and protecting their families. She had several thousand groups. And they would come in every two years at a big rally uh, convention and they would talk about their victories, their victories. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's pretty routine. There are manuals on, you know, how do you put pressure on? How do you keep people from being discouraged? How to put on news conferences, and make petitions, get referendums underway. Uh, so that if anything goes on at the local level, it's because of those, you know, tried ancient ways of, of protesting. We, we now have a bigger mountain to climb nationally, and we've got to be more creative uh, to add to that. Thank you. Yeah. I, really, I really enjoyed your book, um, Only the Super Rich Can Save Us. And I know you've spoken with Ted Turner since then, but I was wondering if you've spoken to any other billionaires and if that book's impacted them at all. Yeah, I, I, I had breakfast with Warren Buffett. He liked it. And uh, uh, Peter Lewis, uh, progressive insurance, he was my classmate. Uh, we actually had a debate, uh, it shouldn't have been a debate, but it turned into a debate uh, sponsored by the New York Public Library, it's online, with Ted Turner, Peter Lewis, and, uh, and me. A, a number of others uh, acknowledged it. You know, the, the rich aren't all that different from us in their inability to make social change that you would like. Uh, one of them told me, you know, Ralph, we all know how to make a lot of money, but none of us has a clue what to do with it. Uh, um, and and uh, unfortunately, um, I didn't say, well, I can give you some ideas. <laughs> it was on the phone. <laughs> uh, I think, seriously, there should be a conference of uh, the tiny fraction of billionaires that are really enlightened and get it, or mega, mega millionaires. Uh, just round the table a couple days with people who know what, what it takes uh, to get things changed. And one of the things it takes is money. Uh, it took money from rich Bostonians to fund uh, the abolition movement, uh, money for the women's suffrage movement, uh, all the way down, you know? We don't like to acknowledge it, but it's true. The Curry and Stern families were the early funders of the latest civil rights wave that started in the 50s. Uh, so what we, we really need to get them together, and that may happen, uh, there's a, a fellow uh, in Seattle who uh, he claims he's not quite a billionaire, but he wrote two articles in, um, in uh, let's see, uh, where do you, what's the, uh, yeah, in Politico. Uh, do you remember his name? Someone said it. Hanauer. Hanauer. Yeah, yeah, Hanauer. Uh, 
you I mean nobody could have written it better I mean he, he he took down his business compatriots on the minimum wage like you can't believe he starts out saying you know I, I go to all these gatherings uh, these big business types and they're talking trends you know they're talking inflation they're talking um, uh, they're talking capital accumulation <laughs> they're talking debts uh, and uh, and what do I see I see pitchforks that's what he sees. So it's, uh, you, you don't want to write off 100% of anybody, even though they give you good reason to, because there's always 1% or so. You talk about the 1% Wall Street. Well, 1% of people mobilized and reflecting public opinion can turn around enormous redirections in our country that are long overdue. I mean, that's 3 million people, you know. You ask anybody who's on the ramparts who are who's making headway on certain things, uh, how many people you have? I mean, they're lucky if they can say twenty, thirty thousand. And what do I mean by uh, active? Just the, the equivalent of someone who has a serious hobby. You know, two, three hundred hours a year. You know, like a serious bird watcher, bridge <laughs> club member, bowling league. That's just what you're talking about. You have any one percent re re reflecting uh, public opinion. And, and you can turn it around. Uh, and that's what the young have to be told. And you can give uh, historical examples of that. I mean, let's face it, the anti-tobacco fight, I don't think there were more than 20,000 people seriously involved in that. But they represented, uh, they, are, they, they represented and aroused the non-smokers, starting with airlines and uh, you know, public accommodations. Uh, and, and they were called every name in the book Denying my constitutional rights. I was on a plane once, sat down, a guy, he lit up a cigar. You know what happens in your kitchen when one toast burns? The guy lits up a cigar. He says, excuse me. He said, that's my right, he said, to do that. So, you know, the, the blasphemy of today is the commonplace of tomorrow, right? And most people under 30 today would say, what, you went into a classroom at college and people were smoking? You, you went on a plane or a train and people were smoking? See how things change. And the same with nuclear arms control and cutting back on weapons, the U.S. and Soviet Union. People never thought that would happen. And then you have the gay, lesbian, oh, that never happened. Uh, and it never took more than a few thousand people who really put their sleeves up to, to get it done as they aroused and transformed public opinion. How about disability rights? You want to talk about, they sat in Joe Califano's secretary of HEW with their wheelchairs and so on. A handful of people turned that around. I never went to school with a disabled child because they weren't going to pick the child up the stairs. Was, they couldn't be bothered. I never saw a disabled, physically disabled child. And I'm sure a lot of you didn't either. Now, look at it wasn't long ago I saw four people in wheelchairs having a race down Connecticut Avenue on the sidewalk. <laughs> who, who would ever have dreamed that we, we would cut, uh, we'd cut into the, the curbs all over our country? So why don't we learn from history, you know, to get going here and stop letting corporations take over our public airwaves and fill every slot uh, Saturday and Sunday and Monday and Tuesday with uh, cheap entertainment, advertisements, and and guys, you know, somersaulting with with bikes. You know, you got to say, that's our property. And we want it to be dedicated once in a while every week to serious things about what people are doing. How they're mo mobilizing so we can learn from one another. It's, oh, they're doing it in Seattle? Well, we can do it elsewhere. We can learn from them. Upping expectation levels is the first dynamic for democratic change. Because if you have low expectation levels of your politicians, they will oblige you. <laughs> so you've got to up the expectation. Can we have one more?